Hey, it's James Langford here in Washington, D.C. I'm getting a chance to connect and talking a little Java with James. Uh, there's no Java, you just get James at this point because we can't get a chance to be together. It used to be uh, we would get together once a week with everyone who was in D.C. that was Noki, and uh, we get a chance to be able to talk through policy and ideas and thoughts and uh, just to be able to kick around all the different issues of the day. Um, but since we can't get together right now with the pandemic, uh, glad to be able to at least connect this way as well. So let me walk through some of the things that are happening uh, this week that we've been engaged in. Uh, obviously, Israel has been a major issue and will continue to be a big issue. Uh, there's been a lot of peace negotiations in the Middle East. The Abraham Accords that President Trump put in place were remarkable uh, and earth-shattering in many ways. Where we've got four nations uh, that actually engage with Israel for peace treaties. Uh, that's not happened in decades. Uh, it now is a whole different issue. Uh, what has happened in the last uh, several weeks to months uh, is there's this administration has been engaged with Iran. Iran's been emboldening uh, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, uh, and they are then just launching rockets into Israel. Uh, so lots of issues with this. Obviously, this is a long-standing issue that's been in the Middle East for a very, very long time. I'm not blaming President Biden on it, but we've not had a clear message from this administration. Uh, and I've tried to speak out to the administration multiple times that we need to make it very clear. We have an ally who is Israel. We stand with Israel. Uh, we don't want terrorism. It shouldn't be hard for the president to be able to articulate we're opposed to people launching rockets into civilian areas. That should be a very straightforward statement to be able to make. For whatever reason, the Biden administration continues to be able to hesitate on that. Uh, making the statement we're opposed to terrorism shouldn't be that hard of an issue. Uh, we do want to see peace in the region. We do want to see a reduction of violence in the entire region. We don't want Palestinian civilians or Israelis, uh, anyone military, whoever it may be, uh, that are killed or attacked. So we do want to see uh, an end to the violence there. But right now, Israel is trying to step up and say, you can't have all these tunnels where you're moving terrorists through. You can't have all these rockets that you're launching in random times into civilian neighborhoods. I understand that Israel is trying to be able to protect themselves and their nation. We should continue to be able to stand with them and uh, and see a, a peaceful end to this, but also see it end in such a way that there's not more rockets coming over next week uh, into Israel. Uh, so that's been a major thing, having a lot of meetings on that. Had a lot of conversation about unemployment assistance. Uh, Governor Stitt in the, uh, made a pretty bold statement this week, and that was to say, we as a state are going to stop all the additional unemployment uh, benefits and go back to our normal unemployment benefits. He didn't end unemployment, he just ended the additional dollars that were on top of it. Uh, which I think is a very good thing to do. And then he incentivized going back to work, saying the first 20,000 people that are on unemployment that get back to employment, they're going to get a bonus to be able to get back to work. Why is that a big deal? We have more job openings in Oklahoma right now than we've ever had in the history of keeping records in Oklahoma about job openings. Uh, we have a lot of job openings across the state, but we have thousands and thousands of people that are on unemployment right now, and they're getting additional benefits. And the challenge is, obviously, they're saying they're just making the logical decision. Uh, I've said to folks, they're not lazy, they're logical. If they make as much staying home as they would going back to work, they're going to stay home. Uh, but it's not good for our economy, for people to stay home. It's not good for our supply chains. It's not good for families, uh, quite frankly. Uh, and so this, this incentivizes people to get back to work. So thanks, Governor Stitt, for stepping up to be able to do that. Uh, that's a good transition of continuing to be able to affirm that. We're doing some work here to be able to get that done nationwide as well. A lot of conversation about infrastructure. We had a hearing on that yesterday on how we're going to pay for infrastructure. That's a reasonable question in the middle of multi-trillion dollar conversations. Uh, we're trying to push everyone here in D.C. back to saying pandemic's over. We have got to not only pay for what just happened, but we've got to be able to make sure we pay for things in the future. But you don't have to do that by saying you're going to go raise taxes on everybody. We're trying to say let's do modest proposals. Uh, the Biden administration saying let's spend two, two and a half trillion dollars on infrastructure because they want to have this historic giant package. Understand that if we did a package that was even $650 billion, that would be the largest infrastructure package that's ever been done in the history of the country. So they're wanting to do this outrageous, enormous package that we're saying time out, we can't pay for that without having these giant tax increases on everybody right after we still got to be able to pay for all the pandemic stuff as well. So we're continuing to be able to do hearings on that. Had another hearing today dealing with healthcare issues uh, on practical things. Uh, like what what uh, regulations were set aside during the pandemic that we don't need to turn back on. Uh, they need to stay off. There, there's some random rules. If you're in healthcare, you track all over. Like for skilled nursing facilities, there's what's called the three-night rule. That's always been a challenge. That was set aside during the pandemic, and a lot of nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities are saying, don't turn that regulation back on. It was a bad regulation in the first place. 
keep it paused. Uh, there's things like telemedicine. Uh, realizing two years ago, telemedicine was not allowed the same way that it is now. Uh, we're saying, hey, leave telemedicine on. I know that was a pause from a regulation. Allow uh, people to continue to do telemedicine. That's very helpful to a lot of people and figure out how we're going to handle the payment portion of that to be able to manage it. But we should do that. So we, we walk through some very practical things with that. We've had nominations this week. We've had other things. And we started build, dealing with China. That opened up. It's an enormous multi, multi-billion dollar bill uh, that I'm one that's saying, time out, we need to make sure that we're going through this clearly. We do need to make sure that we're managing China. Uh, but this bill doesn't deal with trade. Uh, it doesn't deal with critical minerals. It doesn't deal with a lot of the main issues of our supply chain uh, with China. Uh, that is a big gaping hole. So we've got this week and next week that we're doing amendments on it. And uh, hopefully can do some fixes on that bill because we need to confront the China challenge that we're facing right now and how they're stealing our intellectual property and how they're undercutting our businesses and all those different issues. But you've got to actually address trade. You've got to address critical minerals. You've got to address a lot of things that are not addressed in this bill at this point. So we're working through it. Uh, let me bounce a couple of questions because uh, we had we asked earlier today uh, if folks had questions. Quite a few folks uh, asked some questions. Marianne asked the question, what is your perspective about the January the 6th commission that's coming from the House? Uh, the House is trying to send that over to the Senate to say we've agreed to have a bipartisan commission. That's kind of a wink, wink, nod, nod bipartisan commission. The way that it's set up is that it has equal number of Republican Democrat members on it, but the staff is selected by the Democrat chairman. And in this situation, the staff's really driving who writes the report, how the report is written, how we're doing all the testimony. So if Democrats are actually controlling the staff, even if it's an equal number of members, it's going to be a very biased commission. Here's my main point on this. The House has been piddling for months at this point, saying we want to do a commission, and they've been arguing about how they're going to do it. In the meantime, the Senate has actually done our work on this. We've had two committees uh, that have combined together that have jurisdiction on that. I'm on one of those, the Homeland Security Committee. We have an equal number of Republicans and Democrats on the committees, and we've had multiple hearings. We've had multiple interviews, like dozens behind the scenes, uh, walking through these different interviews with people dealing with the intelligence, dealing with what happened, dealing with law enforcement, dealing with Capitol Police, uh, the Sergeant at Arms, the uh, DC Police, the, what was happening in the Pentagon, why things were so slow in response with National Guard. We've gone through all of those things, and we've got about 50 or so recommendations that are coming out of this that we're finalizing the report. The report's completely bipartisan. Uh, we'll have it out in about three weeks. Uh, it's going to be around 100 pages long to kind of detail all of the things that we saw in it and then have addendums for a lot of the testimony that will go with it with a set of recommendations that are bipartisan recommendations coming out of that. So while the House has been arguing about what if we form a commission and a lot of the media has been focused on the commission, I hate to say it to people because they don't even know. The Senate's actually been doing that work and has been doing bipartisan work on this for months in meetings. In addition to that, we've got two sets of inspectors general for different areas that they're just finalizing their reports that are coming out. The Department of Justice is also doing their work. They've got 450 people that they've arrested as a result of this and they're walking through. So all these folks are saying, are you going to support a commission or not? The commission's kind of weird to talk about at this point because the work's already been done for months in the Senate with the inspectors general and with the Department of Justice. So no, I'm not going to support a commission because it's over at this point. We've already collected the data and by middle of June, uh, everyone will be able to see our report. That's a bipartisan report. Literally Republicans and Democrats did together through the whole thing. So that's the whole commission conversation. Uh, Bosco asked a question about cybersecurity and what's the plan on it because it doesn't seem to be consistent. I actually had a hearing on this early this week as well, uh, dealing with cybersecurity and some of the issues that are going on. I've been in multiple calls with the administration on what happened with the pipeline shut down to the East Coast. Uh, for those of us in Oklahoma, we didn't see it, but on the East Coast, uh, there's long gas lines for lots of stations because of the shutdown of the pipeline and the loss of fuel that was there. Uh, so yeah, we've had multiple hearings on that. So there's a group called CISA, uh, that's the federal agency uh, that we've been doing oversight. They work with federal entities to be able to protect cybersecurity. Each individual company is responsible for taking care of their own cybersecurity, but we're working through ways that we can partner together to make sure that we can continue to get information out. This is not new. It's been ongoing for a while, uh, but some of these things were not implemented by the Colonial Pipeline that should have been implemented before. A lot of our infrastructure we talked about for a long time and its vulnerabilities, but it's their first responsibility to be able to take care of it. 
and we do not need to federalize all cybersecurity for every private company and every individual in America. That's a bad idea. That's what China does in their companies. We're not a communist government. We're a free market. But we do need to provide resources so that companies can then apply some of those things uh, because a lot of these attacks are nation state attackers. And we don't expect every company to protect themselves from Russia and China. We've got to be able to make sure when it's a nation state, we're putting some protections in place on that. So that is actually more ongoing than it looks on it. And there's been a lot going on on that. Uh, Brenda asked the question, she just said borders was her question with exclamation marks on it. Totally get it, continue to be able to go through that. Also had a hearing dealing with border security. Wow, that's a mess. Uh, there's a lot going on. We continue to be able to meet behind the scenes to be able to push the administration. Uh, the numbers are sky high. Uh, the April numbers everyone talked about being the highest in 20 years. The May numbers were even higher. I'm amazed at the number of people that have said, hey, I hear the numbers are coming down because the administration continues to release numbers saying the numbers are coming down, the numbers are coming down. What they're not telling you when they release that is, yes, the numbers are coming down of individuals that they're holding at the border because the administration's getting better at releasing people faster into the country. So fewer people are in detention at the border, more people are released into the country faster. So they're saying from the Biden administration, we have fewer people that we're holding, so the numbers are coming down when actually the real numbers of people that are coming across the border illegally are actually going up and the number of people released in the country are going up. Let me just give you one number. The Biden team made a decision to say if someone crosses the border illegally and they ask for asylum and the quote unquote line is too long to get to process, every individual is supposed to get what's called a notice to appear. And if they request asylum, they've got a hearing date that is actually set in a federal court and that notice to appear gives them their date for their court date. If the line is too long, Border Patrol has been instructed just to release them into the country and they should tell people, you can come on into the country and you need to, whatever city you go to, go to the ICE office there, turn yourself in and ask for a notice to appear. Not kidding, that's really what they've done. 19,000 times that's been done in the last couple of months. 19,000 times they've just said the line's too long, we're gonna let you into the country go turn yourself in. I asked Secretary Mayorkas, who's the Secretary of Homeland Security, how many people have actually turned themselves in of the 19,000 that you released into the country? How many people? His response to me was, oh, I think it's been a lot. I think it's been a lot. We went and actually checked the number. It's 550 people. It's 2.5% of the people that they've released into the country have actually turned themselves in and said, I need a notice to appear meaning 97.5% of the people they've released into the country and said, go turn yourself in in whatever city you've gone to, have not. They've just disappeared in the country. 97.5% of the people that are crossing the border under this administration in the last two months where they're not giving a notice to appear, they have no idea where they are. They don't know what city they're in. They're just in the country and we're not tracking them at all. I don't think that's a good idea. And I'm shocked when I run into people uh, that that I talk to them and they're like, I had no idea that's going on. I've been trying to articulate this for a while and we'll continue to be able to get the message out. On top of that, the Biden administration said, we're not gonna do fencing. We're not gonna finish the, the border fence. And I continue to be able to show Secretary Mayorkas the problems on the border fence and the big gaps that are in the fence. As of this week, they started putting up some temporary chain link fence in some of those gaps in the fence, literally just some chain link fence they put there. The steel is already there, it's already been purchased, the contracts have already been paid for, but the Biden administration is so focused on we're not gonna do any wall funding because the evil President Trump did that, that they're putting up chain link fence in some of those gaps in some areas and they're, I guess they're gonna call it good. It's absolutely absurd. That means they've taken out another contract to put up chain link fence rather than actually putting the real border fence up in those areas because they know fences do work and do slow people down to be able to help them cross the border, but they're not willing to be able to do it right because they don't want to say we're like President Trump. That's absurd. And anyone that can look at it can say that's ridiculous. The Border Patrol just wants the fencing up so they can better patrol and it slows people down crossing the border and they can interdict faster. I don't think that's unreasonable. Abigail asked a question about the Supreme Court and about abortion and what happened this week. Great question on that, Abigail. The Supreme Court made the decision to hear a Mississippi law. Mississippi passed a law in their state saying that they are not allowing abortion after 15 weeks. 
The Supreme Court in 1973 in the Roe v. Wade decision said that states can't determine what happens in abortion in their state after the child is viable, and they didn't define the word viable. The Supreme Court this week said we're going to hear the Mississippi case because in the Mississippi case, that is a pre-viable decision that was unanswered by the court in 1973. And so the Supreme Court said we're going to answer one question. Can a state make a decision to protect the life of children before that child is viable? They're going to hear that case in October. That is a case that can most certainly take on Roe v. Wade directly. Uh, Roe v. Wade, by the way, just in case you want to know, Roe v. Wade didn't start abortion. Roe v. Wade required every state to allow abortion in their state. That was the requirement from the Supreme Court in 1973. If the Supreme Court in October hears this case and says every state can make a decision, it takes it back to pre-Roe v. Wade when each state can make a decision. Are, are we going to protect the life of children or are we going to allow children to be destroyed uh, in our state? Our state, I believe, in Oklahoma values the life of every child. It's not just some children. We value the life of every child. And I believe our state uh, would choose to say we don't allow abortion in our state unless it's protecting the life of the mother or other. So I, I think it's pretty straightforward. And so we'll, we'll see where this goes in the days ahead. But again, it's now going to the Supreme Court. It is an epic case that'll be heard. I'm sure there'll be lots of noise about it, uh, but that will come up in October. The decision from the Supreme Court won't be in October. It'll probably somewhere around February, March, April of next year. So a full year from now before that decision actually comes out. But that's what actually happened in the Supreme Court this week, Abigail. Uh, anyway, good to get a chance to visit with everybody. We've been talking a long time. Glad to be able to catch up with everybody on it. You can always contact our office. Uh, Langford.senate.gov is where you go on the website. It's got all the phone numbers there. It's got the email addresses. If you go to Langford.senate.gov on all the social media pages at Senator Langford to be able to track us. Uh, that's where a lot of the dialogue happens. A lot of it just angry, crazy stuff. If you're one of the folks that does that, don't know if that helps you to be angry and uh, to be able to pour all that stuff out. Uh, I encourage people to get into real dialogue about issues. That seems to actually be helpful. Uh, just angry vitriol. I don't think it helps you and I don't think it helps anybody else either. Uh, but again, that's a lot of the dialogue that happens in social media. So be it at this point. Uh, but again, hopefully someday we'll get back into actually trying to solve problems rather than people attacking each other on it. That's what I'm trying to be able to do to set the example on. A uh, quick shout out to AOT Coffee as well. Uh, they've done a lot of our um, coffee for Java with James. We, we miss having them around and having that coffee. It's a great Oklahoma coffee roaster company with a lot of great Oklahoma roasters that are out there doing a lot of great coffee. Uh, but look forward to getting a chance to be able to catch up uh, in the days ahead with the Ote and uh, actually having people sit down and actually have coffee together again uh, and look forward to actually getting face to face, which, by the way, is happening in the Senate now. No mask requirement, just like it is in the rest of the country. Chuck Schumer finally released all that. Uh, so walking around the Senate, walk around the Capitol, no masks anymore uh, with folks that are vaccinated. So for those of you that are vaccinated, way to go. Thanks for taking the lead on it. Uh, for folks that are not choosing to get vaccinated, it's completely your choice, and I respect that. Um, but it's good to be able to see everybody's face again uh, in the days ahead. So God bless you. Look forward to getting a chance to catch up. Keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem, and uh, keep engaging in the days ahead with each other in respectful dialogue.